A variety of track drying methods are being employed this morning in Riverside, California. It's rained all night and on into the morning, but the clouds have lifted above the snow-capped San Bernardino Mountains and will allow this race to get underway. The drivers will battle the weather and the racetrack this afternoon, as this is the most unique circuit in all of Major League Stock Car Racing. A twisting, nine-turn, 2.6-mile road race course with more right than left-hand turns. I'm Mike Joy for Motor Racing Network, and standing at the end of this long serpentine series of S's in the most treacherous corner in NASCAR racing is Ned Jarrett. As they continue to drive the track out, you can see that I'm in turn six, which is one of the most dangerous turns in all of motorsports. Even though it's the slowest point on the racetrack, the lack of banking here can be very treacherous for the drivers. The least little miscue can put them into this wall. In 1964, Joe Weatherly lost his life here when he hit the boiler plate wall. And in 1965, I had took one of the hardest licks of my career and almost broke my neck when I hit this wall. Since then, they have put a cushion here. They have the ply boards with tires inside to sort of cushion the blow, making it not quite as hard. But even so, a year ago, young Tim Williamson lost his life here. They have 500 kilometers to go. They come by here many times, and the least little miscue, Mike, can put them out of the race. Now back to you. Turn six is just one piece in this puzzle. Through the courtesy of the Circus Circus helicopter, piloted by Marilyn and Mel Larson, and Richard Childress, the owner-driver of race car number three, we took a tour around this nine-turn road course. Childress now headed out of the pit through turn one and headed into the right-hand turn number two. He's already in fourth gear, but very shortly he will be shifting down to third gear to slow down. Here he goes now, shifting to third as he makes a right-hand turn. No banking on these turns. He's already through this one and headed to a left-hander not far away. Turns three, four, and five compose the S's, a long serpentine piece of roadway that many drivers cut across on the inside on the dirt to straighten out. The S's lead up to the most infamous corner in NASCAR racing, the sharply right-hand turn six. Here is where they can get in trouble, but Childress negotiates the turn very well and heads the short shoot to the next turn. There is no turn seven on the course the stock cars run at Riverside. Instead, there's this straightaway that leads to turn eight. And turn eight is another treacherous turn here. They can get fouled up very easily. Childers now making that right-hand turn, then almost immediately has to turn back to the left and get set to go down the long backstretch. He now is building speed, headed for the long backstretch. This straightaway is where Daytona-style drafting comes into play, and a great deal of passing is done just out from under the bridge. And Childers now ready for this ninth turn. We asked Richard Childers if this track is more dangerous than the oval tracks. Well, I think a track like this is because you got so many things that you can hit. Once you run off the racetrack, there's a lot of banks and uh, some holes and things like that. Plus, you're running against the left side of the car. You know, if something happens, the driver's side of the car is going to take all the impact. And that could be very dangerous. He's headed out of turn now and on the home shoot, headed for home. Now you see why the drivers will battle not only each other, but the Riverside International Raceway as well this afternoon. As 36 of the nation's finest stock cars are lined up on pit road, awaiting for R.J. Reynolds board chairman, Ed Horrigan, to give the command. Gentlemen, start to your engines. The sound of race cars is a welcome one to the fans and especially to the drivers and crews. Mike, they're very grateful to get this race in today. With the busy schedule ahead, they certainly didn't want to have to come back again next week. The car is now rolling out, ready for 500 kilometers of hard racing and a tough race this is here on this nine turn road course. A light drizzle has been falling on and off this morning and on into noontime as we try to get the Western 500 underway. The 36 race cars are on the track trying to get some heat from the headers and tires to help dry it. But is the track really dry enough for competition? Let's check in the pits with Ned. Mike, I'm standing by with Hall of Fame member Junior Johnson. Of course, owns the car number 11 that Darrell Waltrip's driving, sitting on the pole here today. Has Darrell mentioned about the condition of the track? Well, the track's all dried off, except we were going into nine in the dog leg there, and he says if they get some uh, method of drying it off, like a helicopter over top of it, it, it we'd be ready to go. Uh, there's one little spot over there where you come down into nine, you run about 180 mile an hour at that corner, and you just absolutely can't take a chance on going in there at that speed. You can't stop the car. 
and it'll get loose from there'll be a lot of wrecks there if it don't get dried off. I, I just hope they don't start it until they get that dried off. NASCAR officials have asked the two front row drivers, Waltrip in car number 11 and Bobby Allison in 28, to pull away from the pack and be rabbits to test the track one lap at racing speeds. Still some dark patches of asphalt indicate a bit of dampness as Allison goes to the inside of Waltrip at turn number one. It's funny to see them in these race cars as they rejoin the pack. Waltrip drove the car Cale Yarborough was in last year. Allison is in the car formerly driven by Buddy Baker. Up and comers Ricky Rudd and Terry Labonte in the second row and West Coast champ Roy Smith with national driving title as Dale Earnhardt in row three. And Neil Bonnet and Dave Marcus make up the next row. Joe Milliken had a good ride for this race along with Richard Childress in 10th position. A mixture as we look down through the field. Grand National veterans, road racers from all over the country like Elliot Forbes Robinson and Bob Bondurant. And several up and coming West Coast drivers, all part of this Western 500 field. The grayness of the asphalt beginning to come through as the track looks much drier than before. And here's Bobby Allison in the pits, an unscheduled pit stop for him. That is a tough break for Allison. He was one of the rabbits that went out to see if the track was dry, but now he's had to pit before the start of the green flag. What does it mean, Ned? Mike, Bobby Allison had to make an unscheduled pit stop before the green flag fell. Here with us is crew chief Waddell Wilson. Waddell, what was the reason for the stop? Well, the drive shaft had a slight vibration, and we just wanted to check to make sure that it was all right, and we were able to prepare it, so everything's fine now. That means he will have to go to the rear, though, and that's tough on a road course doing all of that passing where he was up on the front row. Allison qualified at over 114 miles an hour, nine miles an hour faster than the cars he's racing with at the back of the pack. That moves Terry Labonte in the number 44 Chevrolet up to the front row with Waltrip. Harold Kinder drops the green flag, and it's Waltrip. The pole sitter and track record holder that leads the charge to turn one. In the rush behind him, it's Labonte moving into the second spot. As Walter begins to open up a lead through the S's, those little white strips are called the dragon's teeth, the ripple strips. You're supposed to keep off those, but Walter is shortcutting all the way down and up the hill to turn number six. The sharp right-hander, it's Walter, followed by Labonte in 44, Ricky Rudd in the 88 car. They're single file through here, passing very difficult in this part of the racetrack. Up to turn number eight, another sharp right-hander. Again, Waltrip continues to extend the margin as he makes the sharp left turn and heads for the long back straight away. Speed's increasing here out of turn number eight, and before they hit the brakes and downshift, they'll be up to 180 miles an hour. Here you see, Mike, they run single file down the back stretch as they go into the little dog leg here. Waltrip now getting ready to go into turn nine. Of course, he's geared down and heavy on the brakes at this point. Waltrip is the overwhelming favorite here at Riverside. He's won three of the last four Grand National races on this track, plus an international race of champions event. So he's four for five. Out of turn nine, they snake sharply to the left to set up for the left hand. Turn number one, cutting all the way across the racetrack. And here's trouble, Mike, is coming out of turn nine is car number 24. Cecil Gordon has lost it. He slides to the infield. And here's Waltrip now back in turn six already. Waltrip's advantage begins to decrease as the fire and safety crews quickly on the scene look over Cecil Gordon's car. That hands down signal that he's OK, no fire on that machine. And Cecil refires the car, but a lot of smoke from beneath the hood. And it'll be a long drive back to Virginia for Cecil Gordon. Here's Bobby Allison. He's moved up to challenge James Hilton for 25th position. Allison has already gone by 10 cars from his back of the field starting spot. Through turn number one and heading for two is here's Waltrip leading Terry Labonte down the back stretch toward turn nine. Labonte moving into draft Daytona style at 180 miles an hour. And into turn nine, a 180 degree right hand corner. You spend more time in turn nine here than any other turn on the race course. So it is critical. And Labonte continues to close in. 
Waltrip's early advantage has diminished and it's down to a car length as they cross the start finish line. Left hand, turn number one, taken flat out. And there goes Labonte. Waltrip slowing down. Something has happened to a car number 11. Labonte scoots by just like Waltrip was standing still. 24-year-old Terry Labonte, surprise winner of the Southern 500 in 1980, assumes command of the Western 500 and opens up a tremendous lead. You see how difficult passing is here as Dale Earnhardt in the number two blue and yellow machine had to wait for Waltrip to negotiate that corner. And there goes Waltrip in 11 off on the escape road. He definitely has problems. Waltrip way back in the field and here is Bobby Allison. Yet on the ramble, he's fighting now with John Gunn for 24th spot and moves in on Bob Bondurant. Allison of the number 28 car. Spending what seems to be an eternity in turn nine and look at how close they come to the concrete. That's the fast way around this corner. Allison moves in on former West Coast champ Jim Insulow. And he is on the charge, moving up into 22nd position. And here's Darrell Walter coming in the pits in the car number 11. It's taken him a long time to get back here to the pits as the car slowed down. The Junior Johnson crew go to work on that car. Young crew chief Tim Brewer, Jeff Hammond, the rest of the fellows looking over the ignition on the car, Mike. And here's Terry Labonte back in turn six as the leader. Labonte is not much of a road racer. He's only been on this course twice. But car owner Billy Hagan brought Labonte to Daytona last November to run an IMSA road race. So he has some right turn, left turn experience. And here's Walter back on the track as Junior Johnson looks very disappointed about making that unscheduled pit stop for an ignition problem. Well, it's a tough break for Junior, but Bobby Allison in car number 28, second fastest qualifier, is still on the move up. In only the fifth race of his career on the demanding Riverside Road Course, 24-year-old Terry Labonte out of Corpus Christi, Texas, is leading the Western 500. Labonte, who drives for Louisiana and Billy Hagan, in this Chevrolet, a 1977 model that is due to become obsolete after the running of today's race. These cars, which have been on the Grand National Circuit since 1975 with only minor changes, will give way to a new breed of smaller, more contemporary race cars, such as these, the number two car of Dale Earnhardt, a 1981 Pontiac, and racing Earnhardt for second spot is the 1981 Thunderbird of Neil Bonnet. Bonnet picks up the draft of Earnhardt as they head down the 180 mile an hour backstretch and makes a quick move to the inside and takes Earnhardt as they head into turn nine. These cars have a five inch shorter wheelbase. They're narrower and slightly smaller overall than the current crop of Grand National Racers, though they will weigh the same. And this is the look of the future in Major League Stock Car Racing. Joe Milliken in the number 75 car moves in on West Coast champion Roy Smith. Smith in number 45 from Vancouver, British Columbia, the first Canadian driver ever to win the West Coast Championship. They're battling for fourth position as they cross the start finish line and head for turn number one. Here's Milliken moving on the inside, making a slick move and moves around and takes over that fourth position. Oh, trouble up in turn nine. Lots of smoke from Herschel McGriff's car. He looks to have exploded an engine. McGriff, one of the best drivers on as the caution comes out, has been running NASCAR for many, many years. In fact, Mike, I remember seeing him race when I was just a kid. He's been at it for about 30 years. <laughs> Herschel McGriff from Bridalvale, Oregon is out of the Western 500 as leader Terry Labonte is the first car on the pit road. Labonte stops for service as Daryl Bryant and the Billy Hagan crew go to work. Neil Bonnet of the Wood Brothers cars come on to pit road and their speedy service is evident. Well, Mike, during a caution period, they all come in, take advantage to make that first critical pit stop. You see the Wood Brothers are going to the left side for a tire change of tires. Now they're coming to the other side to change the right side. But the first car off of pit road is Terry Labonte in the Billy Hagan car. Here's Ricky Rudd's car number 88 as they change all four tires on his car also. Right behind him is Benny Parsons in the car number 15. So everybody taking advantage of this caution period. Ricky Rudd is away and Neil Bonnet leaves the Wood Brothers pit with four fresh tires and a fresh tank of gasoline. As Junior Johnson waltzes the jack around the front of his race car, we wonder how different are the new Grand National cars? Ned took a look earlier. 
This is the look we've been seeing for the last decade or so in NASCAR racing. This car is 76 inches wide, which is a lot of sheet metal to be pushing through the wind at high speeds. The new look that we'll see starting in 1981 is like this. Only 63 inches wide, some 13 inches narrow. That can make a whale of a difference when you start pushing the cars through the wind at high speeds. And there's a difference also in the length of the cars, as we can see here. This new car will have 110 inch wheelbase, where this one had 116 inches. And there's also a difference in the configuration of the body on the car. For instance, the back window on the new car is much straighter. And there's not as much deck lid space on this car. This one has a sloped rear window. That could make a difference also on the high-speed racetracks. So it's going to be interesting to see just what the new cars will do. Getting set for the restart, which here comes on the back part of the circuit, coming off of turn number eight. So the cars will be under the green flag coming down the long back stretch. Pit stops have reshuffled the order, but it is Texan Terry Labonte who is at the head of the field as they build up to 180 miles an hour down the back stretch. Richard Childress has now picked up the second position with former West Coast champ Bill Schmidt in third, Roy Smith in fourth, and Ricky Rudd in the fifth position. Ricky Rudd has never driven on this race course. A former go-kart champion before he took up stock car racing and won the Rookie of the Year title in 1977. Rudd moves underneath Roy Smith to move up to fourth spot. Mikey has adapted to this track very well. He came out and took a course from the Bob Bondurant Driving School. Watching Bob Tertaglia, one of the back markers, spot flame belching from the back of his cars. He's about to be overlapped by the leader. There's Richard Petty running in 10th position right now in car 42. Lavati moves out of turn number eight. A lap car separating him from second place, Richard Childress. There's Bill Schmidt driving 73, sliding the car out of turn number eight. He's in the third position, trailed by Ricky Rudd. Backstretch. Rudd moves up to pass Bill Schmidt for third position. Mikey does it with the ease. He moves the Chevrolet around the Buick that Smith's driving here today. And here's Neil Botta diving to the inside of turn nine, and he just about runs out of racing room. Rudd, the 88 car in third, Schmidt is fourth, and Bonnet is fifth. Close to that wall coming off at of turn number nine. And Bonnet cuts back toward the inside as Rudd begins to build a margin in third. Schmidt holds off Bonnet as they go to turn number two. Rudd with a little bit of breathing room as Neil Bonnet in the Ford looks for a way past Bill Schmidt. Too wide in the S's. This can be tricky and dangerous. There goes Schmidt for a ride through the countryside, straightening out one of those S's. But as you can see, it's not the fast way around. Bonnet in 21 moves up to the fourth position. Beat. And in the pits is Don Whittington the World Challenge for Endurance Drivers Champion. Finished in the top 10 here last year, but now he's in the pits with trouble. Mike, most of the time when they put oil into the engines, on especially a passenger car, they put it under the hood, but you can see they're doing it under the deck. This is the oil reserve, and this is where it's carried on the left rear of these cars. Of course, they carry about 24 to 25 quarts of oil and don't have the big oil pan that a regular passenger car would have. Well, there'd be no room for that 25-quart oil pan under the engine, so they use what's called a dry sump system and carry that oil in the trunk. Tough break for Don Whittington. Dale Earnhardt, the blue and yellow car number two, the defending national driving champion with a brand new 81 race car, moves underneath Bill Schmidt at turn number nine, and Schmidt holds him off. Ned, that's a tough place to pass. Yes, it is. Earnhardt got in a little bit too fast, really had to get on his brakes to keep from running over Smith, and that gives Smith the advantage he needed to pull away. Earnhardt looks for another shot at him at turn one. Diving to the inside, but that will be the outside at turn number two. Meanwhile, here is Bonnet. He's gone by Ricky Rudd and put the Ford up into the third position as Bobby Allison 
moves past the car he drove last year and up into tonight's spot. Front of the field, Terry Labonte the leader with Richard Childress running second. Terry Labonte driving the number 44 Chevrolet leads the Western 500 at Riverside, California. And the only guy at the track happier than Labonte is standing in the pits with Ned. Mike, I'm standing by with Billy Hagen, who owns the car number 44 that Terry Labonte is driving out there. you got to be proud of that boy. He's really getting the job done. Oh, really delighted. It's just uh, fantastic. Billy, this is quite a difference from when you were here a year ago. Well, we've learned a lot in a year. And he has learned a lot right along with the crew. That's right. He's improving well, every day, every race. Well, good luck to you the rest of the race. Okay, thank you. Back behind Labonte. Is Richard Childress right on his tail? Neil Bonnet riding third, then Ricky Rudd, and Bobby Allison has come from 36th starting position to move up to fifth. Childress over the dragon's teeth, the ripple strips at the inside of turn six. As Neil Bonnet has moved that forward up into the top five, Allison and Joe Milliken and Dale Earnhardt in pursuit. Single file out of turn six. Up the short straightaway to turn eight, and Childress is closing in. Richard Childress, whose car we used to take a ride around the track before the race, is closing in on Labonte. Mike, I don't think I've seen Richard Childress as aggressive as he is here today, and it's good to see him running up there. He lost major sponsorship from a year ago, now a complete independent, but really giving them a run for their money. Neil Bonnet, the third place car, as they head down the back stretch to turn number nine. Childress in second position with no major backing. His only sponsorship from this race comes from a local hamburger franchise. Childress hopes to attract a major corporate sponsor, so has everything to gain and not much to lose, as this car will be obsolete tomorrow morning. And Childress goes to the outside on Terry Labonte, and in his number three Chevrolet, takes the lead at turn number one. Richard Childress out of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, leads the Western 500, and here comes Bonnet. In the Thunderbird, he gets sideways going into the turn, but takes the inside away from Labonte and second place. In 12 years on the Grand National Circuit, Childress is without a victory in 264 races, but now he leads the Western 500. Contrast his style with that of Neil Bonnet. Childress throws the car into the turn and muscles it around, while Bonnet employs a bit more finesse and draws a finer line around the racetrack. Here's the third place battle with Labonte and Bill Schmidt, as Richard Childress comes out of turn number eight and into the back straightaway, leading this Western 500 in a Chevrolet, with Neil Bonnet's Ford Thunderbird in hot pursuit down the back stretch. And here's Bob Bondurant in the pits in car zero three with the hood up on it. That's a bad sign, especially under the green flag. Bondurant, a former Grand Prix racer, is making a comeback. And several of his driving school students are in this field, including Neil Bonnet, Kyle Petty, Terry Labonte, and Ricky Rudd. But here is Richard Childress, surprise leader of the Western 500. There's the margin. He holds over Neil Bonnet, who went to Bondurant's school last June and but for one car length, we'll have beaten Darrell Waltrip to the checkered flag here. Childress dispensing with lap traffic. Bonnet sliding the car out from turn number one and drawing ever closer as Childress goes over the ripple strip and down through the S's. And here's Terry Labonte into the pits. We noticed him slowing down a little bit earlier. They've changed the left side tires. Normally on oval tracks, Mike, they change the right side tires. But Labonte, an unscheduled pit stop here now as the battle goes on up front. Terry Labonte out of the pits with fresh left side rubber. With mostly right hand turns on this course, it's the left tires that take the abuse. And Childress's lead has evaporated. Neil Bonnet has tracked him down coming up the hill. And around turn number eight, Bonnet will be looking for the draft down the back straightaway. It'll be interesting to see how the new 81 model will draft on the old model car. It's a smaller, so the bigger 77 model is opening up more wind for him to draft on, but Childress seems to pull away. Childress, the white Chevrolet number three, second car on the screen, he's the leader. Neil Bonnet trying to run him down as they head for turn number nine. They left by Steve Pfeiffer. Childress trying to stay glued to the inside of the racetrack around this 180 degree turn and Bonnet draws in ever closer, sweeping out close to the concrete wall. Bonnet 
at the start finish line, looks to the inside of turn number one. Childress shuts him off. Out of turn one, short straightaway to turn number two. Childress with his rear view mirror full of Bonnet's Thunderbird, lapping by John Gunn and into the S's. Right turn, left turn as they waltz two by two, down through the serpentine and up the hill to turn six. Mike, you almost feel like you're sitting in that car weaving back and forth as they come through those S's. Anybody who thinks road racing is dull has never seen these Grand National cars at Riverside. Childress in the Chevrolet at turn eight, over the ripple strips. That cost him some time. Let's see if Bonnie can make a move on him now. Bonnet capitalizes with a fine line coming out of turn number eight, and he is tucked tightly in Childress's draft in the back straight. And here they are now, gaining up towards 160, 170 miles an hour. Now Bonnet makes his move. Neil Bonnet uses the Daytona slingshot draft to move past Childress into turn number nine. Childress tries the inside. A late-breaking move, but runs out of racing room. Neil Bonnet puts the Wood Brothers 1981 Thunderbird into the lead in this Western 500. Uh -huh. Neil Bonnet, runner-up here last June, has come from seventh starting position to lead the Western 500 and has proven beyond all doubt that the new 81 race cars are competitive with their predecessors. Ned Jarrett is standing by in Neil Bonnet's pit. Leonard, a lot of people were wondering what the short wheelbase cars might do on this racetrack, and uh, would it have been your opinion that maybe it would be a better race car here? I thought it might be a little bit better. Uh, that's the reason we brought it. You Why? Know, because it, uh, the, the weight had more weight, uh, excess weight that we could put uh, it, it, you know, on the rear wheels where the other one uh, would have had more weight on the front wheels. And uh, the body being lighter let us put uh, the weight that we have to add, we could add it to the rear, which uh, gives better traction coming off the corner. And also it seems to run better if it's a little sideways than the other car did. Well, Mike, here's a man that knows what he's talking about. They've set winners up here so many times in the past, including the first four 500-mile races run by NASCAR on this Riverside International Raceway. Leonard Wood talks about the car being a little sideways. Sometimes it's a lot sideways. As is often the case with the NASCAR racers come here to Riverside, and the skies are beginning to threaten. It's gotten very dark here over the south part of the circuit. As we watch Ricky run of the 88 car, leading Joe Billiken and Richard Petty, fourth, fifth, and sixth positions, coming round turn number nine. And Mike, it seems as if they're sliding a little bit more coming out of that turn. It is getting slippery from the raindrops that are beginning to fall. Milliken baits a pass at turn number one, and Ricky Rudd, in his first Riverside appearance, holds him off. Rudd in his first drive for the Die Guard Racing Team, replacing Darrell Waltrip, who left to go to Junior Johnson. Here's Milliken again. On the inside of the S's. Takes the spot away from Ricky Rudd. And Richard Petty making his move now. And a daring move it is as he just makes Rudd move right out of the way and takes over the position. Petty knows the places to pass on this nine-turn road course. He's won here before. Well, for Rudd, it's his first appearance at right turn, left turn in NASCAR racing. Richard Petty has now moved up into the fifth position after starting well back in the field. And it's raining hard back at turn number six. The car sliding as the raindrops begin to pelt the speedway and the caution flag is out. The skies had lifted to allow the start of the Western 500, but now the circuit is wet once again. Pit stops under the caution period have reestablished Richard Childress as the leader of the Western 500. And that's not a typographical error on your screen. Richard Petty is indeed in car number 42. With Darrell Waltrip, Benny Parsons, Bobby Allison, and Ricky Rudd changing cars. And now the Petties? I'm confused. We all identify our athletes with numbers. And every race fan knows that Richard Petty has been associated with car number 43 for 22 years. Now watch this. 
His son, Kyle, is coming to the number 43, Richard going to number 42. Kyle, is this going to put extra pressure on you in the car that's been so successful a number over the years? I don't really think so. I mean, you know, uh, people thought that running the number 42, being my grandfather's number, would put a little bit of pressure on me or anything. But uh, 43, to, to him, is, uh, is his number. And I mean, you know, as far as the only pressure on me is not to crash it and just take care of it. Well, let's see what Richard has to say about that. Richard, why the change? Well, you know, I, I went out through the winter and everybody was changing cars and numbers and nobody asked me to change cars and numbers. So I said, well, what the heck, I want to get in on the action, so I'm going to change too. But uh, not really uh, it's a financial deal. Uh, you know, it's the way the rules were set up. Uh, you know, if you got a winning car last year or this year, you get on one kind of payoff. And uh, if we can take 42 and put it on a... Uh, NASCAR payoff, then we can make a little bit more money, so that's what we're after. Some people make changes of this sort to say to change their luck. Was that in the thinking? No, not really. Uh, I've, that 43 has been with me so long, and uh, I've been so lucky all these years to do as good as what I have. Then, uh, from a luck standpoint, if I wanted to go anyway, I'd stay with 43. Well, those of us who are reporters, he's just added confusion to what was already a confusing 1981. Well, if Richard's luck has changed, it's not for the better. He's had to make a late pit stop, and here, in car number 42, Richard will have to take the restart at the back of the field. Neil Bonnet posted as the leader of the Wood Brothers Ford. The Alabama gag up front, Bonnet and Bobby Allison. As we get set for the restart, coming out of turn number eight, they give them the green flag as they hit the back straight away. And Bonnet stands on the gas with Allison in hot pursuit. Terry Labonte and Ricky Rudd trail them down the back straightaway. Mike, these two drivers have put on many good battles on short tracks around the country and even on some of the super speedways, but they're friends off of the track, but when they get on the racetrack, the friendship ceases. Bonnet was Allison's protege through many years, and it was Bobby that engineered Neil's first Grand National ride. Allison in the number 28 car was the second fastest qualifier but started dead last on the grid after he had to make a pit stop before the initial green flag. Bonnet out of turn number one and coming down to two. Allison drafting tightly into the flat right hand turn number two and down through the S's. Allison moves to the outside which becomes the inside as they go to the right turn and he sweeps past Bonnet and into the lead. Very slick move by Bobby Allison. He's very crafty on this racetrack. He's a master at slipping through these turns. And trouble on the Neil Bonnet car. Bonnet is off to the inside of the race course at car number 21 and off the pace. No smoke from the car, Mike. Something must have gone wrong in the gearing. Bobby Allison up front, beginning to establish a lead in his black and silver Chevrolet the leader of the Alabama gang who's raced here in stock cars and little Dotson Trans Am cars as well. And Dave Marcus having problems in car number 71, just coasting very slowly. One of the finest drivers, hard chargers on the circuit. Tough luck here today. And Marcus's car sits parked outside the entrance to turn number nine. Benny Parsons slowing down in car number 15 also. Parsons driving the car that Bobby Allison drove a year ago, heads into the garage area and out of it here today. He's a former winner on this racetrack as he pulls the Bud Moore car number 15 into the garage area with battle scars all over the right side. And trouble up at turn six, J.D. McDuffie goes off the course as Don Waterman slides and spins into the mud. There's McDuffie's car sliding back down from the hill with a rumpled front fender to show for his trouble. See if they can move away. There goes Waterman. Looks more like a tractor pull than a race car as he brings out the caution flag. After a brief caution period, Ricky Rudd leads the Western 500 in his first appearance on this racetrack. National driving champ Dale Earnhardt is second with Bobby Allison third. And here's the fourth place car, Richard Childress in car number three, leading the sport's all-time winner, Richard Petty, for the fourth position. Mike Joy with Ned Jarrett here at Riverside International Raceway in California. Unique among all the NASCAR Grand National Stock Car tracks. The fourth place battle continues between Childress and Petty through turn number eight. And Neil Bonnet has called it a day and rolled his car behind the pit wall. Neil, what went wrong with it? Transmission come out. 
as Bonnet's car rolls powerless off to the garage area and back to Stewart, Virginia. Here's the battle for fourth. Childress, one of the sports ranking independents, battling Richard Petty. Petty with 192 career victories. Childress yet to win a Grand National stock car race in 12 years of trying. They're battling for the fourth position, but Childress has done a great job here all afternoon in battling with those that have been winning races in the past, but Petty really putting the pressure on. Past the start finish line and into turn number one. A flying left hand turn that the drivers take flat out. Downhill to turn number two, the sharp right hander that begins the S's. And Petty goes to work on the back of Childress's Chevrolet. Petty closing in. Has a look to the inside of the racetrack. Muscles some racing room from Childress on the outside and takes away the inside at turn five. Uphill to turn six, Childress holds the inside and they just about scrape paint as they come off turn six. You just can't race any closer than that and we'll see who runs out of racing room or nerve at turn eight. Childress on the inside but he's over to the Dragons team. The ripple strip and that cost him valuable time and then this time it cost him fourth position. Yes it did as Petty was able to get traction and move away but Childress right on his back bumper. Back to the front of the field, Ricky Rudd. Driving the Diegard Racing Team machine, vacated by Darrell Waltrip after last season. Rudd has some big shoes to fill, and it's his first race ever at Riverside. Bobby Allison, second place car, is closing in on Ricky Rudd. There's the interval as they come off the ninth turn. Rudd at the head of that group, and back there is Allison in closing. Well, as Neil Bonney gets his safety paraphernalia off and crawls out of that car number 21, first, Neil, what happened? Well, Ned, uh, earlier in the race, I've been having some trouble getting the car in third gear, and I've been trying to baby the thing all day from the first lap. You know, I've been thinking about pacing myself, and on the restarts, I'd let them go and then just gradually work my way back to the front. And the thing, I went down there in front of Bobby and going to second turn and put in third and let the clutch out, the transmission exploded. You're running one of the new short wheelbase cars here. How did you like it? Ned, I couldn't ask for the car to do any better. We felt like that was going to be the asset of the car. After everybody else got their tires hot, we thought we could go faster, and that's the way it turned out. Back up front, the battle for first is a hot one. Bobby Allison is closed right on the bumper of Ricky Rudd. And Rudd, the newcomer to Riverside, is being pursued by one of the sport's craftiest veterans. While Richard Petty prefers to pass on the S's, Allison likes the backstretch. He's able to build up momentum by picking up the draft, but this time, Mikey staying right behind him, but don't seem to be gaining too much. Now he's moved in closer. He's moving to turn nine. A Waddell Wilson builds the engines on that car, and he does indeed wrap past Ricky Rudd to take the lead. Bobby Allison up front. The engines in that car have powered the Harry Rainier machines the two fastest 500 mile races in history. And they certainly gave Allison enough power in the back straight away that time. The silver and black number 28 Chevrolet of Bobby Allison assumes command of the Western 500 with Ricky Rudd in his rookie appearance on this racetrack, holding a strong second. And here's trouble in turn nine. J.D. McDuff is spun out in car number 73, Bill Smith crams into him as other cars slow down and maneuver around. The action happening at turn nine brings out yet another caution, and here is Kyle Petty rolling to the garage area after running a strong race in seventh position. And here's Ricky Rudd running in second place in car number 88. It looks like the engine has gone a wire on that car. So two of the sports up and covers are out of the Western 500 after fine drives this afternoon. And for Ricky Rudd, his first experience at Riverside will be a memorable one. He'll be a man to watch in the Die Guard car this season. Neither Bill Schmidt nor J.D. McDuffie were injured in that grinding crash, but the pit stops under caution have reshuffled the order. And coming down for the restart out of turn number eight, Terry Labonte in the 44 car leads Bobby Allison. Out of turn eight, and they get the green flag and are about to lap by the light blue machine of Joe Milliken. Labonte, the red and white Chevrolet, closely pursued by Allison in a tight Daytona-style draft. And Bobby Allison wastes no time in trying to retake the lead, and he's doing it where he's been so successful all day, and that's on the long backstretch going into turn nine. Allison takes the outside into turn nine and outbreaks Terry Labonte to take the lead. It's Allison. 
in the 28 car with Labonte and Richard Petty moving into challenge. J.D. McDuffie has walked back to the pit area where he's with Ned Jarrett. Well, J.D., you're a long way from home to have something like that happen. What really did happen? I don't know. I went in number nine, laid my foot on the brakes, and it locked up. You know, it started coming around and spun, and another car hit me. That has to be a hairy type of a feeling. Yeah, it is. To stop down there in nine, it is. Especially a man a long way from home, 3,000 miles or so. That's for sure. That's a tough break to be this far from home. But more importantly, he and Bill Schmidt are unhurt. Here's the battle for third position in car number two, 1980 NASCAR champion Dale Earnhardt moves around Richard Petty, the sports all-time winner in car number 42. Earnhardt in a brand new 1981 Pontiac, typical of the cars that will run through the rest of this Grand National season. Up front, about to take the white flag, Bobby Allison in car number 28 has come from last starting spot on the grid after having to pit before the drop of the initial green flag. One more lap to the checkered flag for Allison and his black and silver Chevrolet that will be retired at the end of this race. But Mikey can't let up for a moment because Terry Labonte, you can see, not too far behind Allison as they go through the S's here and move into turn six. Labonte has been very impressive today and closes on Allison at turn six. But oh, Labonte gets loose out of the turn. And that allows Allison to pad his lead as he goes to turn eight. Terry Labonte at 24 years old, Grand National Racing's youngest active winner, trying to track down one of the drivers that knows this course the best, into the back stretch. Last June, this race was decided between Waltrip and Bonnet on the last turn of the last lap. It could happen again. Can he pick up the draft? Here's where he'll have to do it. He'll have to gain a lot of momentum going down this long back stretch if he's going to catch Allison. At 180 miles an hour, that draft will have some effect this far back. Allison is through the dogleg and dives into turn number nine for the final time today. On the last of 119 laps around this nine-turn road course, there is the interval between Allison and young Terry Labonte. Experience and age versus youth and determination, it is Allison who perseveres and takes the checkered flag to win the Western 500. Bobby Allison, leader of the Alabama gang, and we'll be going to victory lane in a moment. In his first race for the Harry Rainier Racing Team, Bobby Allison has rolled into victory lane and pocketed $24,000. Let's go to net in victory lane. Well, they just crawled out of this car number 28 the first time. Bobby, in victory circle, you have to be proud. I really am, Ned. Uh, it wasn't a perfect day for us. We had some problems, and the crew responded tremendously, and... Uh, you know, the car just kept on going fast and strong and everything kept working and I didn't make too many mistakes where I tore the car up or anything, so uh, it all worked out for us. The veteran Bobby Allison wins the Western 500, but with second and third place finishers, rising young superstars Terry Labonte and Dale Earnhardt serve notice. Richard Childress scored his best ever finish at Riverside, winding up fourth while Richard Petty, the sport's all-time winner, finished in the fifth position.